Hi, I am Emma Davidson, Fashion Features Director at DaysDigital.com. We're at Copenhagen Fashion Week and I am joined by Irvin, Laird, Nora and Bruce. Um, first of all, it would be fab if you could all introduce yourselves and kind of tell us a little bit about what you do. So we'll start with you, Irvin. Uh, I'm Irvin Latimer. Uh, I'm the creative director of Latimia. And alongside fashion design, I also do some uh, writing, lecturing and consultancy. Fab. And Led? Um, I'm the senior uh, archive editor at Vogue.com. Um, I guess that means that I focus on putting fashion in context. And I also have a, a special beat in Scandinavia and been following the market for a long time. So super happy to be back. Yeah. Nora? I'm Nora, I'm head of communications at RenewCell, and we're a textile recycling company. And we're producing a 100% recycled material called Circulos. Um, and we're actually, Circulos is the partner of Copenhagen's new talent program that they're launching, where Erwin is part. So it's great to be here today. Amazing. And I'm Bruce Pask. I'm the men's fashion director of Bergdorf Goodman and Neiman Marcus. Um, I'm really thrilled to be back here in Copenhagen. It's been a couple of years, but I've been to the show many, many times. I'm a particular fan, and I think find the market incredibly exciting. So I'm really, really excited to be back here. Fab, thank you. And so in a time when emerging designers are facing more challenges and hurdles than ever before due to rising costs, a global pandemic, many, many other factors, we're here to discuss how best the industry can bolster support and nurture rising talent. Um, and since we only have 30 minutes, I'm going to get straight into it. Um, so first of all, and this is to all of you, um, but let's start with Irvin. What are the biggest hurdles and challenges affecting designers today? And what are the opportunities that may not have been there previously? Um, biggest challenges? Um, huh. Yeah, I, I wonder if I can speak for all young designers, if I, could, if I should just speak just for myself. I mean... Uh, 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 resources are a challenge. It's, it's really, really difficult to, if you want to meet demands of sustainability, if you want to meet demands of uh, social responsibility, uh, good design, etc., it requires resources. So even if you have, you know, great ideas, etc., you can't do that without, you know, connections and resources. That's why the new talent program is so vital and so important and I'm so 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 happy to be a part of that um uh I think maybe some of the opportunities that are there now that haven't been before obviously we're all so much more connected so even though you need resources obviously it's a lot easier to um get your work out there uh or if not get your work out there but at least get some exposure for your work compared to before. But it's an inter I feel like I should answer this question after the show and not <laughs> right before the show when I feel like all, all of the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it does bring up the point of having the show mm -hmm. and, and the challenges during the pandemic as a retailer that to discover new talent during that time when it was purely a virtual world was really, really difficult. So for, for young designers coming up in that time in that market, new and even established is just showing their wares uh, purely screen-based was very, very hard for anybody to make new discoveries, take risks on new designers, to, uh, to, to make orders with accounts that they hadn't opened yet because we were relying on the trust and the relationships we've built over the many years with the brands that we were you know, currently working with so I think that alone just logistically just became incredibly challenging for anybody to be able to kind of give these very needful and worthy designers a chance. I think time is one of, is a resource as well. Mm -hmm. It's the only resource that cannot be monetized. And I find that demands on designers, even the audiences that they need to talk to, you know, direct to consumer, your web audience, your, you know, your everything, like that could take up all of your time <clears throat> and lead less for creativity. And one, one issue of, I don't like the term young designer. I think emerging is a, a term I prefer is, um, I noticed a change, um, around the two thousands when, the the normal or the the usual not normal um, 
system of graduating, working for someone else, and then establishing your business once you had contacts has largely fallen away. And so we have many designers that haven't put in the time, which doesn't mean that they shouldn't start, but but that the time that it takes to develop, to lose your idols in a way, I think also there's a rush for everyone to start and get in. And I think that's another aspect of time as a, as a resource that we don't, we don't talk about. And Nora, can you tell me a bit about your work with new talent and how, how that kind of came about and yeah, how you're working with emerging designers? Yeah, it was just as Erwin said, we realized that the emerging brands and, and designers, they're having a, a very tough time finding the good materials that they want. They want to be working with the better materials and the innovative materials, but the innovative materials are, are usually dependent on scale or trying to find these larger volumes. So what we're trying to do is to work closely with the brands uh, to help them to see what resources they need in terms of the supply chain because they don't haven't built the, the relationships within the producers and so on uh, that the larger brands has. And just as the pandemic has shown, it's um, we're it's the smaller brands that are really affected by the, the higher prices and the logistic problems. So we need to kind of help them, um, help us to get the, the material out there and, and to be where the, the smaller designers are as well. Mm -hmm. And so many designers say to us, to me, we want to be sustainable. We want to work this way. We can't afford the more sustainable option. So the desire is there, but the accessibility to the materials is not, and that is a hurdle that needs to be cleared at some point. And the research capacity, and I, I think it is this materials that you bring up, absolutely. Also access to manufacturing factories, like uh, putting young designers in contact and touch with factories outside of their immediate geography that can be really, really helpful. And I think the other aspect that I think is very, very challenging for emerging designers is the idea of needing multiple skill sets. Like it is not enough to be creative. You have to have a fiscal mindset. You have to have an HR component. Like, and it's just too much to ask for a young designer. We see why uh, designers like Mark Jacobs had his Rob, Robert Duffy. Uh, you know, that these partnerships are needed because the designer needs to be able to focus on things creative to have the support of another partner that can manage the other aspects of that, and I just, I think that is, the, the, that kind of division of labor, I think is, is really, really challenging. And there's this <clears throat> almost, excuse me, almost like a paradox there that as an emerging, you know, talent, there's this expectation that, oh, so you're going to show the most exciting new materials and most exciting new things, but usually those emer emerging designers like me are the ones who are least connected and kind of least uh, have a foothold in the industry. Right. And it's an interesting, like you say, like, just the idea that um, to have sustainable materials, you need to make a lot is completely backwards because we, from a consumption point of view, we should be making less. So it doesn't make any sense that you need to, you need to order kilometers after kilometers of a certain material to, to be able to produce it. Just as one example. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I, if we're talking about incubating talent and emerging designers, I think a lot of it also lies with with education so you know I talk to so many designers all the time who have been creative in university but then have not really been equipped with kind of practical know-how you know mm -hmm. accounts and things like that which is for me I think is a big struggle for a lot of them coming out and you know not really having a clear I'm wondering how was this something you kind of picked up or was it something you were taught Irvin? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, kind of after graduating from my master's, I sort of realized that it's it really um, we're taught to be designers in like a junior position, basically. At least that that was my experience. That you're taught to how should I say this? Uh, well, let's put it this way. I don't I don't feel that the, like I would graduate with like exactly like the business know-how and like all just like practical like production things like mm -hmm. how you might have those um, these amazing ideas and you you do like couture level materials and, and constructions but you might not be able to do that anywhere 
like at a factory. So just this sort of like practical how to get things done. And I, I, uh, at least speaking from my point of view, from graduating from Alto in Finland, I feel like, you know, there's great creatives and great designers that graduate from there, but they graduate to be kind of then led by someone else, not to lead their own brand or do kind of lead their own creative vision, I think. Mm-hmm. I think there's great value in what we do as creatives, as artists, as artisans in being an apprentice, like graduating from school, having that developed aesthetic sense of self and then working with somebody who has experience in the industry is running a viable business. And I think bringing your creative um, aspects to that while you're learning how to operate, I think the operations aspect of it, I think is really challenging for emerging designers. And I think, uh, apprenticing and learning and, and really it's almost like stepping back and still having that um, real hunger to be a designer but recognizing that there are a lot of more tools in the toolbox I need to develop before I'm ready to do my own because to be a viable brand as uh, everyone's saying it, it requires a lot of masteries of skills mm-hmm. so I, I, I fully support the idea of, of having mentors and really, really apprenticing. Mm-hmm. And if I can add, I re- what I really kind of like what you say is this idea of like apprenticing and mentorship because it's completely different than having an internship position at a big brand where you have these preordained tasks that might not, they don't necessarily yes, nurture exactly. your yeah. specific talent. And I'm not I mean, saying all experience is exactly. important. We're but candle makers when you come down to it. I really I love to refer to it as we're candle makers and the skill is lost if it's not brought down generation after generation, like every aspect of it. I think we have to look at it as simplistically as that. Like we inhabit and own these skills that are very, very specific to our industries. And I think to be working with a master or somebody who'd been... Uh, uh, you know, expert or in the field for a long time, but you know, master craftsman. I think these um, I, I, master tailor, just absolutely invaluable, invaluable. And then, how have they made it through the test of time, the, the business challenges over the years? Because those are things they've weathered, and that is knowledge they can absolutely um, share and 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 um, enlighten with people working with them. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that this rush for newness and discovery is sometimes at the at the detriment mm-hmm. of of the talent because I, I mean, the question is, I think, do we ask too much of designers? Can someone be a left brain and a right brain? There are only twenty four hours in the day, yes. and mm-hmm. one thing, um, having covered the Scandinavian market, especially in Stockholm, a lot of the brands are duos or trios. They happen to often have gone to school together, but it's it's often friends working together. There's a a collective approach, which seems to me so mm-hmm. much healthier because one person is one person, and I worry that the creatives don't even have time to be creative because they have to do everything else, and that's what we need them to for for us to grow for us to see new things and new directions they need to be able to give their time and passion to to what they have inside of them and and i I just worry that that the clock is just ticking and and creative becomes the last thing that there's time for Mm -hmm. Mm. um and bruce how do you kind of work with emerging designers at bergdorf and name marcus um and what do you kind of look for in in uh, terms of emerging talent and for people sure. that you want to work I, that's with. a great question and it, it's something that i personally have like reassessed over the last couple of years because i think that um, i've been at burgers for 8 years my background is in journalism i've grown up in working in magazines and menswear specifically and in journalism my entire edi- um, editorial career and moved into retail about 8 years ago um, so i have a very strong editorial point of view um, I was very aware of a lot of what was happening out in the market with new designers. It was very much an interest and a curiosity of mine. Um, I think what we've developed over the last few years is taking more of a step and recognizing that we have a responsibility as merchandisers, as buyers, as retailers to do more than just preview a line, decide if it's right for us or not, and then write an order or move on. 
I think we've recognized that we have a responsibility to work more closely with brands that we think um, could benefit from our help, could use the factory um, and connections that we may have awareness or, or uh, information regarding. Um, you know, mentoring with designers and, you know, maybe taking time and maybe the order doesn't get placed then, but we're working with them and talking to them about what we need, what we can help with, where we can kind of, uh, you know, what is a retailer, what we're working on and what the intersection between us can look like. But I think there's a lot more generosity for that. And I think it's changed a lot that it's not just this transactional relationship anymore. There's a lot of development that's a part of it that I really, really love. Mm -hmm. And same, Nora, like how are you working with new talent, with, with the talents? And um, what do you look for in the people that you're you know, selecting for the, for the initiative? I mean, I, I fully agree that we've also realized and changed over the years of how we do this. And we talk a lot about collaboration within the fashion industry and we need collaboration to be able to shift it. And it all comes down to what's driving the market. And, and we see that it's the emerging designers. For us, it's the emerging designers that are driving um, demand for sustainability and they're so close to the consumers and uh, they have this relationship and they have this view of sustainability um, that not a lot of the larger brands has and that's something that we want to promote and to be able to uh, support so we work with all kind of different brands and in the same way it's about um, how can we help them within the supply chain and how can we help them long term can we start developments and we might not be able to do it right now but we can do it for along and I mean this is not usually how a fiber uh, or a pulp producing company is, is working but we see that this is how them we have to uh, to be able to uh, support what's happening on the market and, and how to kind of make that shift mm -hmm. and led in terms of like publications like mm -hmm. talking about you know we're always kind of looking for the new next thing how can publications and the writers and journalists kind of also support rising talent without, you know, skipping on to the next and continuing. Um, I've become increasingly honest about what I see um, and always try to do it with respect and love. Um, but when there's something I don't understand, I'll say, I don't understand this and this is why, or this is what I'm seeing. Um, I think if someone doesn't feel ready, we, we wait. Um, of course, there's the CFDA Vogue Fund, and then on Vogue Runway, we have different ways of, of covering people. Um, I think it's always about, I guess authenticity is the, the buzzword now, but that a vision, someone that, that, you know, is just sort of, you can just feel that they're not willing to compromise because there are so many voices coming at emerging talent, you know, you should do this, you should do that. And, and some of that advice is very good, but sometimes the, something gets lost in translation when you're trying to please people. So I think it's about really believing in what you're doing. And the more and more I talk to young designers, we might call them sustainability natives, like we call digital natives. They, they study knowing that they need to work with this, but many of them say, I need to justify why I have a brand for myself before I can start it. And, and that gives me a lot of hope for the future because I think it, it's an added layer of really having a mission. That's how I see young designers, emerging designers, having a mission because they know to put something more in the world needs, needs to be really important. Yeah. Definitely. Add to that as well, because I do think some of the work is on us. You know, as a retailer, you know, as an editor, as a, you know, fabric and, and a fiber, uh, you know, innovator, you know, we have to recognize our responsibility in this, in this world. And I know that I personally have, you know, talked to a lot of emerging designers and said, I'm working on my comfort level with being more risk taking, more comfortable with risk in believing in a brand and whether or not they have a brand identity that may have awareness with uh, in, the, in America uh, that our Bergdorf Goodman and Neiman, Market custom, Mar Neiman Marcus customers recognize it. If there is a brand on the floor that they don't know, that's there because we think it's great. 
and that we think they'll appreciate it. And that's an element of discovery and that's something that's exciting and that's become a big directive for us as a store is like we have you know, to be more comfortable with risk, calculated risk, but uh, to, to look at talent and recognize that they don't have the advertising budgets, they're not gonna have the brand identity. This is our responsibility in getting the word out, getting the awareness out and being more comfortable with that. And, and that's been, I think, a real tremendous shift and something we're very proud of at Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman. Yeah, great. Um, oh, sorry, we... If, if I could just add, add real quick, oh. and I think in general, when talking about sustainability, and I think sustainability relates to starting any new brand, um, you know, I think we we also put too much responsibility on the consumer that the consumer needs to make good decisions and they need to find the right information and find the right brand. But I think there should be much more emphasis on companies and creatives and entrepreneurs of for them to just create good decisions, if you understand what I mean. So that that, that it shouldn't be up to, you know, people to find out what's good, but we should only give good options. Make really. it easier for the customer, yeah, exactly. help them out, excite so. them and, and educate. Absolutely. And that's one of the exciting things about Copenhagen being a sustainable fashion week because mm -hmm. Sustainability doesn't have an aesthetic. It's not necessarily homemade or crafty. Mm -hmm. um, it's all sorts of aesthetics. Um, and so it, it works as fashion and hopefully it works in not destroying the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so to come back to something you said earlier, Bruce, about how it was quite difficult during the pandemic when there was no shows um, to kind of find that rising talent that you wanted to stock. Um, for me, speaking to that, to some designers, it kind of leveled the playing field for them. Mm. And obviously I I certainly missed Fashion Week and coming away feeling inspired and, you know, seeing a full vision. Um, but yeah, it's, I think throwing a fashion show or staging a fashion show is like quite stressful for designers and, you know, with funding, it's hard mm. to get funding. Do you think it's, I mean, we're at Copenhagen Fashion Week and it's great, but like, do you think it's really necessary for, for um, brands to stage fashion shows? Um, so I'd like, um, Irvin, maybe you could go first. Sure. Um, uh, what should I say? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I do, maybe it's also because I am I am just like, a, I, oh, I'd like to consider myself as like a, craftsman so there's this like tangibility that i appreciate i think sometimes nowadays things are a bit more a bit too much about aesthetics on like an instagram screen or whatever so i think you i think you need that you need the human element you need the body moving with the clothes in a real space with actual people watching but then within that does it need to be a show that's like built on the moon and everyone's flown there with a rocket ship. I don't know if that's necessary, like sustainable or good, but I do, I do think that in this world where it's hard to kind of understand what's real and what's just an image, I think it's important to have things mm -hmm. physically present, whether it's a show or a presentation. Mm -hmm. But again, it's also too much to ask, especially emerging designers, to have amazing grandeur shows because they're really expensive and really difficult to do. Mm -hmm. and oh, I have strong opinions about this um, <laughs> <laughs> because I've I because I've watched designers feel like they must do a show, and I think there's an assumption that if you do a show, you get orders. That's not it's not an A and B proposition. Um, so. I think for me coming out of the pandemic, the, the win for designers was that it became possible to choose if you were going to show and how you were going to show. And I think to not have that pressure to do a runway as nice as a runway is. And in my experience, when you are an emerging talent, there's often a great benefit of having people touch the clothes. And I think tactility has become extremely important over the over the pandemic, the, the, the security, the softness, the comfort that fabric and mm -hmm. fibers can give. So I think being able, especially for an emerging designer, to see that the se seams are well done, to catch the details, and also to be able to interact with the designer. To me, a presentation is often uh, preferable. I th I've been told it's not much less expensive than a runway show, but I often think that that's a really good way to start and work up to a show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and Bruce, do you? Yeah, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I, I do have to say, I do think that being in the room for a fashion show is incredibly important. I mean, it's, it's magical, it's inspiring, but it's also those other additional aspects of it, the people that you meet, the conversations that you have, the connections that you make. It's about everything that has everything and nothing to do with the actual show. So I think that's very important. I absolutely agree with what Laird said about this kind of development uh, mid and post pandemic, the idea of self-determination. I think it's never been more permissive than for a brand to decide what is best for them, how to present, how to show, what's gonna work best, whether it's a small salon style show, is it a presentation, is it a full fledged runway show? I think there is great opportunity and freedom and, and I think an understanding, a better understanding and generosity from the industry to allow for designers to do what they need to do whenever they want to do it. I, you know, these schedules we have are important, but if they don't work for a brand, then they can do it when they want and they'll figure it out. And that's what I really, really love is we've kind of opened up the doors for more permissiveness in fashion. I think tactility, the word that Laird brought off is, is really, really perfect. We do need to be in the room with the clothes. And whether it's in a showroom, on a runway backstage, like that is vital and that is what we missed over the pandemic and that was what made it hard for the younger designers to have their clothing seen and felt and touched and worn. And that's I think where here at Copenhagen Fashion Week is, is a dream for all of us to see in the many venues and ways we're gonna see clothing. Um, but it's about being in a room with a garment and being able to see how we and people interact, how it fits and that. But I think it's, in, in a sense, it's a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of to round things off, um, as a buying director, as an editor, what's kind of a piece of advice that you would give a rising designer on the come up um, in terms of their business and you know making, making it a success within fashion? Go? Take your time. Oh my gosh, that's so good. <laughs> That's great, Laird. I love that. I think we're in a very um, challenging time, and I think there's a lot of pressure on people coming out of fashion schools, out of creative schools, and and I um, I also mentored schools at, at Polymoda and at SCAD in Georgia, and it's it's really important because I think there's so much pressure on emerging designers to be fast, be quick, be at the, you know, be at the front. And, and I think it, you end up losing a lot of those opportunities to gain skills, to gain knowledge, to gain awareness. And I, that's such a great, it just, that was, that was perfect. But also like, take I, the time, take the time, but also that's why I really reject young designer because like a jury that I'm on in Rome, many of the people aren't, some of the people are recent graduates, but many of them have worked, some for exactly. 10 years, some for five years. But they, but they, in many cases, they really know, like, I did this, I wasn't finding this, like, this wasn't me, mm -hmm. I, this wasn't available. It wasn't that it wasn't even, it's not just about the availability, but like, there was something that they needed to express that no one else was expressing. And I think, I think, you know, it's, we want newness, but what is what is the what is the ramification for the person that is developing newness? Because what's new is always changing. So I think we need to invest in in what we're calling new and giving time to, so that we're being fair on both ends. Mm -hmm. And I think what's new can also be renewed. I mean, I I, I love this idea of, uh, and I think again, Laird's really nailing these things. You know, emerging designers. I think is absolutely great again, permissive way to talk about newness in the creative industry. I, I don't think we should be terming these things young. And, and it's again, it's just to be as a, inclusive as possible. Um, I also like what we spoke about earlier is, you know, find your people, find your collective, find your partner, find somebody else that's going to really help build your brand together that understands you and what you want to do, but can also bring the skills that you don't have because the collective mind is the strongest. 
Mm -hmm. You know, the opinion that is, uh, you know, garnered from many is going to be the best. So I would say, like, definitely find the people that are going to help you. And as a collective, as a group, um, I, I think that is, is a really, really uh, necessary thing to have as many multiple skill sets in the room that one person will just simply not be able to have. Mm. And we don't acknowledge fashion as a collective effort. There's no one designer that I know that exists that does everything themselves. There's a team. It is a collaborative uh, process, you know, working towards a singular vision. But fashion is a collective. Um, and I think, you know, it's never sort of talked about like that. So it, if you can be collective in the studio, why can't you be collective in marketing and business? I mean, it's already happening. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for being with me, with us, um, and have a great fashion week. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.